don't know where everyone is. It's just six. Hi, Matthew. Hey, Jennifer, how are you? I'm okay, how are you? I'm doing all right. I'm trying to figure out which lighting works so that... Um, you don't have the glare good. that I do in the well, window? Well, yeah, exactly. Um, so Ben said that he was not gonna be able to make it. So I don't know if that leaves us quorumless or not. I don't, I don't know. know if it's um, guys. It's not going to be there. If Petra can't make it as well, um, and so I hadn't heard back from her, but she had said last month, I think, that she had a conflict for July sixteenth. Um, so that would mean Petra, Gazit, and Ben, and so that's three of six, which would leave us with me, Sid. Uh, and Deborah. So that would not be a quorum, which would mean that this would not be an official meeting. Um, so it would be a reporting session, basically. Um, but we couldn't deliberate and we couldn't um, make any, uh, any plans that would be binding on any of us moving forward, at least. Mm -hmm. So um, how is your time away from Amherst? I ask while you're on. I just came in from a beautiful walk on the ocean. <laughs> so I think we're going to go to Newport when we're done here. And go on the cliff walks for a late evening and a late supper. That sounds lovely. Yeah. It's beautiful out. Yeah, I've not yet made it outside today, but at some point. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. It's in one of those days. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. See if anybody else is. So somebody, we have another attendee. Yep. Sid. Hi, Sid. Hello. How are we? Doing well. Doing well. I just saw the uh, email from. Uh... I think, uh, what's his name? Uh, he said he's not going to be able to make it. Ben, <laughs> Ben, yeah. Ben, yeah, Ben, yeah. So um, we're, if, uh, I believe Petra is, is here and will soon join us as a uh, panelist. Uh, so that's three. And I think uh, Deb Neubauer at least uh, spoke with me or, or emailed a couple of days ago saying that she wanted to, Yes, so she, she just joined. Yeah, she yep. just joined. Hi, Deb. Hey, Deb. Hello. I'm going to um, keep myself muted because I got home about 15 minutes ago and I'm gobbling my dinner. <laughs> That's all good. <laughs> so I'm going to mute myself. Okay. Um, so if Petra is actually able to sign on, then we'll have. Uh, We'll have a quorum and we'll be able to start the meeting. Yep. Everybody's healthy, family's doing well. Think things yes. are what they are. Yeah. I know. I mean, what do you guys what are you guys doing, Matthew, at, at your institution? What's what's the all plan? I haven't been following it. We are, we are going back. We are having the kinds of testing where the swab goes up towards mm -hmm. your brain. Uh, yep. And uh, so we're, and then we're gonna be having masks on all the time that we're in the same space. Uh, we have plexiglass that's being delivered and uh, put in as we speak. Um, and, uh, and then for people who need an accommodation, we're, we're also teaching online. So uh, that means that we're going to be in a box where we're teaching. Um, yeah. it, we're standing in one space so that we can be recorded, so that everyone can see us, so that, and at the same time, teaching people who are there live and who want to be able to interact. So, 
So we're working through it. We'll figure it so out. You'll be, you guys will be in the classroom. So you have face-to-face, -face, but also Zoom capability. Both. That's right. A hybrid model. Okay. That's right. Uh, so yeah, it's a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Yeah, it is, yeah. Because we just say UMass, only, I think it's only about 15% of our students who have face-to-face -face classes. Everybody else is going to be all on Zoom. I mean, virtual, not on, it's going to be other platforms. But it's going to be interesting. I don't know. I don't know. Keeping us all awake at night. Yep, yep. And then, of course, yep. there's always the other stuff. So I've, I've had a brother, um, my, my only uh, surviving brother has been uh, in and out of the emergency room over the last oh, month. Wow. So, um, yeah. So. With, not COVID, with COVID? With COVID? Uh, no, it's, it's, um, it's heart related. Uh, a friend of mine who's an ER doctor has said that the um, pericarditis and things like that only come about after you've had a viral infection or something. So it's probably something viral, but they haven't been able, he hasn't tested positive for COVID, so. Okay, good, that's, that's good. So we'll see. Hi, Petra. <laughs> Hello. All right. Um, so I hope everyone's doing well. I'm gonna call the meeting to order at six after six. Um, and uh, the first thing that we need to do is make sure that there's nothing uh, that we need to put on the agenda. I will tell you, I've heard um, there, were, there were two requests for the meeting from uh, commissioners. One was uh, for a review of the distinction between the role of the chair and the, and the town staff liaison, uh, as well as the commissioners. Um, and the other was a report back on the town's meetings and uh, understandings with the police department. I was not at the July 6th meeting, uh, so I can't report on what occurred when the town council uh, had a specific meeting to deal with yeah. the police. But if, if any of the rest of you were, um, that, that's something that we can talk about in the context of discussing the, uh, the, our role in conversations uh, with the um, public school police department in the town more generally, uh, you know, housing, um, issues of health, issues of um, business development and economic development. So uh, there's a question of what our role should be and how many conversations we would need to be a part of. And uh, there's also the possibility of the town starting something else that would be um, specific to uh, the question of anti-racism, um, but that might be a little bit more complicated, but we can talk about that in a bit. Um, Matthew, the, can I just jump in for a second? Sure. Um, I saw a post on Facebook, not by any of the HRC commissioners, um, that there was some town meeting where something like 57% of those in attendance uh, wanted to see the police's budget cut. I was, and that, but that happened very recently. That wasn't July 6th. That was like last week or something or Sunday, or I don't even know when it was. I was like, I found out about it on Facebook. <laughs> right. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of this push because we're also dealing with it in our institution, you know, the defund, reform and abolish, you know, the, the, the all three areas of the police department. So that I mean, is, you know, what's going on nationally. And I think every area is really taking a look at, at the police department, right? Based on everything that is going on nationally. So um, yeah. I'm not surprised the, with those numbers personally. They had, they, it was under, it was spoke about at budget review. Okay. So they had budget review. And so during public comment, several people spoke in regards to the 57% cut to the police department budget. Right. And, and it, I think the cut, oops, is the cut about relocating the funds to some place somewhere else, yes. right? Okay. Yes. Right. So I think that that's uh, one of the issues that we've looked at and we've talked about is this notion of uh, the police wanting to have or being comfortable um, with the budget going elsewhere if someone else will take responsibility for the behavior. 
that is currently within their uh, their ambit, the stuff that they're supposed to do. So um, if they don't have to deal with calls to uh, look at housing um, or, or disputes between uh, people who may have mental difficulties and therefore uh, might might be better to have someone who could counsel. There's there's a concern though that um, that those situations might cause a threat or might seem to be a threat to other people. And therefore, do you want someone who is also trained not just in de-escalation, um, but also in uh, deterrence by being able to hold people uh, and having the right to do that? That's something that we can talk about a little bit more when we get to our discussion items. Right now, um, we need to finish uh, making sure that there's nothing else to add to the agenda. Uh, again, I, I think that this is part of our, uh, our discussion of uh, where we should be involved in these conversations. So I think that that's on the agenda. Um, but if there's anything else that should be on the agenda that is not, if you could let me know, I'd appreciate that. Um, I had also asked about um, uh, wanting to follow up about the webinar and also think about future actions. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I, I clearly, I intended to have a lot in those conversations because I'd be looking at the conversations that we've had and reporting back on them. Um, there's no way for you to know, having looked at the agenda, all of the things that are in my head that we'd cover in that. Um, but, but that's part of, of looking at the conversations that we've had thus far. So, so we'll be reporting back on whatever conversations we've been a part of. Uh, there was a conversation um, around the uh, July 4th, uh, um, what, to, uh, what to the slave is the 4th of July conversation um, that followed up on the readings that were done. So that would be part of our discussion too, I think. Mm -hmm. um, So uh, if there's nothing else to add with the understanding of what else is already included in the agenda, um, then there's the question of review and approval of the commission uh, minutes from June 18th. Mm -hmm. They are very long. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that. I know. I had a moment when I had to like call Jennifer and like, I don't know what to cut out of this discussion. These notes are very long. <laughs> so I don't know if we want to like take a month to review them and then we like approve or whatever in the next meetings. It would take a while to go through them. Right. Yeah, I, I, because I only skimmed through to it myself to the issue. Yeah, and my reading of them suggests that there's a lot of kind of reporting of what people said. Um, and again, I, I know that that's part of what people are looking for at this point. Like, how are we thinking through this? But um, the minutes are intended to be the action items taken by the commission. Um, what votes were taken, what we expect to do moving forward. Uh, so I'd wanna look at that a little bit more closely for that um, to see where there are action items in there and what we say we're going to do prior to voting to approve. Um, so uh, Deb, you've said that you're okay with us waiting till next month. Um, Sid, you uh, said Yeah, that. I, didn't, I didn't read in depth through it to right. tell you, so I skimmed read through it. Okay. Um, Petra? You're also okay with that? Okay. Yeah. All right, um, then we are open for public comment. Um, we have a couple of attendees and uh, if, if they have something yeah. that they would like to share in public comment, uh, we are all ears. Yeah, there's two right now. I should note uh, that uh, anyone who speaks to this meeting is being recorded. Um, you should know that uh, anything that you say at the meeting, therefore, uh, will be recorded and will be shared. 
with that said, we are uh, open to public comment. I believe the way to do that, if if you're interested and you um, don't know how, is if you hit uh, participants, you can um, click something that says raise your hand. You can be approved to talk. And then uh, once you're approved to talk, you'll have the opportunity to speak. If you don't know how to do that, just put a question uh, in the question and answer. Oops box okay uh, i don't want to rush through things i know sometimes people ask for a volunteer and then immediately speak and that stops anyone from having a chance to volunteer um but i also uh would be willing if if uh, i am speeding through things and someone puts up their hand within the next minute, uh, I'd be happy to recognize them at that point. Um, otherwise, I think we're going to move on for now so that we can uh, go through some of the discussion items. Um, so we have been engaging in conversations since our last meeting on June 18th. Um, uh, we had the uh, Juneteenth celebration that was televised. Um, we uh, all were able to receive um, books relating to reparations. Um, and so if you are a commissioner and you haven't picked up your book yet, please do so um, and, and feel free to take a look at it. Um, we also have had conversations um, Again, around July 4th, there's a conversation. There have been um, rallies in town of other people who are expressing their voices. The, um, with regard to policing, uh, I believe Gazit Kaya spoke at our last meeting about the fact that uh, she and um, the uh, Dr. D and uh, Dr. Amalkar Shabazz uh, had organized a meeting with our police chief. As I was mentioning earlier, my understanding of that was that the uh, police department was uh, willing to shift funding to other areas um, uh, for behavior that they feel they have to engage in, that's currently the responsibility to engage in, um, if someone else was going to do that work and if it was no longer going to be considered part of their responsibility, right? Um, we know that uh, 60 years ago, there was a lot of money that was in social work. That money has been pulled out of social work and put into other places. There was money for, um, for better, for worse, for, um, for inpatient counseling for people who had uh, mental difficulties that money has been stripped from those types of, of companies uh, and, and state agencies. And we saw a lot of people become homeless in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, and we saw that um, people then had to deal with the homelessness problem and with crime uh, or, or at least reports of potential crime among that uh, population. And we saw police getting more and more involved, especially as we're dealing with kind of broken window policing, all that kind of stuff, right? So. Um, you know, I think one of the things that uh, if there comes a time where we are asked to opine or if we want to lead a, a conversation around this, I think one of the questions I would have is uh, what type of behavior that the police are currently engaged in um, we see as shifting to uh, other agencies, what, um, what hiring we could do and what kind of support we as a town would actually give. I think there's room to do that, um, but it's going to mean a, mean a change in perhaps the number of uh, police officers, because if you don't have as many calls that they're responding to, you might not need as many police officers. And it might mean hiring in other areas as well. Uh, so I think that there's a, a lot to discuss in that question. Um, Jennifer, were, uh, were you actually um, at the meeting where that was discussed and, and were there uh, reports on, uh, on where the money could be shifted 
um, and, and were there people in town who worked at the other types of agencies that said, yeah, we, we could use that funding. The, I was at the budget hearing. I wasn't at the July 6th meeting. Okay. So at the budget hearing, several public folks who spoke at public comment suggested that the money get switched over to social services. So we don't have a social services fund or account or uh, we don't have a social show. Sorry, I'm beach struck. We don't have a social services department at the time. So uh, there's talk about that and then there's an additional eighty thousand dollars and then there's discussion about what would happen with that as well right so and how was that how was that taken by the members of the town council when people were making um those public comments do was that yeah was that i think place? yeah no i think everybody for the most part understands what they're saying is if basically if you have two people who have mental illness and maybe a social worker could be better or one person who has mental illness then maybe a social worker to respond to that might work out better than the police because often the police you know not by any nothing to do with the particular police officer but just the uniform can cause somebody who has mental illness to have post-traumatic stress disorder or just react poorly to the police and so I, you know, I think every, the council understands what's being said. And I think at this time, you know, really it's going to be the community that really needs to kind of rally to push for those types of changes. I, you know, I just, I, yeah, I can't really speak anything else of it because I. Go ahead. I'm curious. I'm curious if there were any. Uh, agency people who actually do this work who thought that they could uh, like you know create this position supervise it you know that they could do this I'm just curious if anybody in that kind of situation was there um, not during the time period that I listened to it no yeah um, most people spoke just saying that they were in support of it for defunding the police I mean that was basically the message and to take it and move it to social services or for services for people of color or for like a, a community organization and just so forth and so forth so do you know if the town will be doing an assessment of those these services because, you know, of course, you, got, you have to do an assessment before, you know, changing, moving those monies and all this other stuff because you have to know what services, you know, you can provide what's available, what's the capacity and all this other stuff, right? So, um, yeah, and I don't, no, the budget hasn't been finalized yet. Okay. And so um, we just have to kind of sit and wait for them to, but I think that they've done with all of the uh, public comment period of the budget. Okay. And the it presentations was, from departments. It would seem like you'd need um, a request for a proposal if you're having an outside um, consultant who would do the kind of social work. If you're not going to ha create an agency that is internal to the town, if you're not going to have it under Julie Fetterman or someone like that, then you're going to have to um, hire an agency as, as uh, we work with um, outside consultants that have uh, worked on housing issues, for example. Um, and so uh, we would therefore ask for them to propose how they could serve the town in a particular way, but we'd have to have um, a list of what we're looking for them to do so that they could then propose how they would do it, what the cost would be, all that kind of stuff. So it seems like there are ways to go about creating that um, an entity, either internal to the town by saying, here are the offices that already deal with uh, questions of, um, of uh, mental illness, um, dependency issues, uh, homelessness or, or, um, or housing precarity issues, um, deal with questions of um, you know, I'm trying to think of the, the other other ways that the police would interact with um, with people and with people of color. Um, and because there are ways to do it, um, it's, it's great to hear people say, 
we can slash the budget by a particular amount. But if it comes back to us, I think the question, or if, if we were to try to support a conversation, we would probably want to uh, have some idea of what our community, what direction our community would like the conversation to go in. It seems like it would take a long enough period of time that the budget, which will be set because you know all the public comment on it has been completed and it's now in the town council's hand, um, it wouldn't have any further effect on the budgeting for this upcoming year. And that might be okay because maybe it takes time to really prioritize at least you know, over the course of a year, we'll have a chance to see what the, the needs are that aren't being met. Um, and then by next budget cycle, we might have a description of what we're looking for. Um, but there, if we're going to do that, if we're gonna take a year to do that, um, then it might make sense to start those kinds of conversations now. Um, that goes back though to where the Human Rights Commission should be involved. Um, our public schools, I know that there's a lot of, of uh, teachers and staff and students who have been talking about the need to have conversations about anti-racism in the schools. Uh, the police department is obviously a space where a lot of people are talking about uh, how we can deal with anti-racism. Um, and then the other aspects of the town, there are a number of different places where incrementally people are treated differently based on a lot of their background. Uh, and so we would need to figure out uh, where we think we fit in and where we think we can add uh, the most to the conversation or at least bring out the conversation the most so that it is representative of what our town actually would like to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know in, in my social justice circles, you know, the folks that I connect with, that the, you know, from the police department, there has been an outreach by Chief Livingston and Captain Ting for some of them to, some, some people in the social justice uh, world to come and do some of the, that work, right? I specifically, I don't know what that looks like, but I know outreaches have been made in the area to do some anti-racist racist work with the department. Um, maybe you know asking them specifically from you know from the human rights department uh, commission asking them what specifically that means and then we can talk more about it and see if there's more input we can put into it i think that would that would be that would be a, a good conversation to have maybe at, at, at our next meeting with more people because i would like to know right what kind of what kind of work is that that is being done by this, these folks, and, and these folks are amazing. I know, I know lots of them, and I know the type of work they do, so. But specifically, I don't know what they're gonna be doing. Other thoughts? Well, I, it seems to me, right, there's a lot that we don't know, I think, right now, and there's a lot of questions and conversations, so um, how does all that you know, get clear, especially in terms of the role of the HRC. Will it, you know, will we just sort of facilitate a conversation? Will we participate in a conversation? Are we responsible for taking a position? Do we need to have a unanimous position? I think I just don't really, there's so much I don't understand. Okay. Um, I, I want to raise the point. Um, you asked whether we would facilitate. Um, and I think that that has come up. Um, I will say that just before our last meeting, I had been contacted by um, the chair of the town council who asked uh, whether I would be interested in facilita facilitating a conversation um, around anti-racism. And I, I said that I personally, um, there's a lot on, on all of our plates, I'm sure, professionally, personally. Um, and I, I pointed out that um, a, I do think that um, when there have been people working in uh, areas of equity, um, and particularly at this time period, racial equity, um, and who can be paid to facilitate, we should do that. Um, and 
I don't want to uh, step on their toes because while I lead a, a number of conversations when I teach um, in, in federal criminal law and international criminal law, uh, the issues of ethnic violence and, um, and respect for different groups and the history between groups. Um, there, there are people who will speak more specifically to uh, the questions of uh, police abuse and, uh, and the, the history of that in the United States and be able to facilitate conversation more um, and, and allow for uh, group discussions more. So um, Jennifer, I, I wanna thank you for um, helping to pull together the, um, really pulling together the, the um, conversation that was uh, led by uh, Dr. Holmes on July 11th. Um, one of the things that was tricky about that though is the town was aware of, um, of people not respecting uh, a public space and, and therefore Zoom bombing and, um, and therefore we had it in a webinar format. The webinar format allows for um, more speaking out and less conversation. Uh, there was no ability to break it in, break out into breakout rooms and allow for small group conversation. And I think a lot of the people who signed on for for um, that conversation of the the kind of history of racism and, and how we can be anti-racist were hoping to have the ability to talk with each other. Um, so one of the things that I think we need to think about is if we are going to allow for conversations to begin, how do we make sure that they're the conversations that people will come to, people will come back to so that it can be an ongoing conversation uh, and that it won't turn everybody off. Um, and, and so I think that's something we kind of need to work through um, whether it's going to be in questions of continuing to interact with um, the police department, uh, trying to have more interaction with the schools. Obviously the schools have a lot of other stuff going on right now. They're trying to figure out who's gonna be in the classroom next year um, and, and a, lot of, a lot of other questions. And, and a lot of people are working towards uh, or around equity questions in the schools. And I think that that's really important. Again, our January meeting, um, we had the chance to talk with, um, with staff in the schools and talk to them about how important it is to move against the disparities that we're currently seeing in the Amherst schools. And I understand it's a nationwide problem. Uh, that doesn't mean that we have to allow for it to continue in our part of the nation. Um, but it does take work and it does take funding. And there are choices that have to be made to support um, revisions in that system. So the questions of where we plug in to conversations with, uh, um, with schooling, especially the part of the schooling that is post elementary and therefore is not purely within the control of the town of Amherst. Um, again, with the police department, I'm hearing from uh, at least said that there are people who are trying to have different conversations um, and from uh, from Deb as well that there are conversations about particular funding amounts that could come out and can, and can go elsewhere. So I think we need to figure out how to engage people in the conversation of where that goes in a way that is proactive and um, positive for the town uh, and also anti-racist. Um, and then what other aspects of the town would need to get involved. On top of that, there's the question of whether uh, that needs to be done or should be done through the Human Rights Commission, um, which our bylaw is about educating people in the town of Amherst, as well as responding to complaints if someone wants to bring the complaint to mediation before the Human Rights Commission. Um, but those, those are our two, uh, the two components of our work. And so education is definitely there, um, but it's education about discrimination of all uh, various kinds that are, are in the bylaw. 
there's a lot of other components to the town and education would be helpful in all of them. How much involvement should we have? Um, do we have an obligation to have? Do we have a right to have when people who say, look, I've been trained to be a police officer and what you think of as police training today is very different than it was 20 years ago. So it's great that you wanna come in and help with my education, but you need to understand what expertise I have in the first place, right? So, um, and that could be true for every type of department that we would be dealing with. So um, what role should we have um, or should we have an entity that brings together, um, it, we, can, we can bring people together. It doesn't have to be education with us having knowledge and sharing it. It could be us bringing together people who have knowledge and trying to help them share it with each other. Um, is that something that would be more um, doable for us? And, and what should that look like? I actually really love that idea of um, bringing in people who work in the field, both in terms of racial equity and in terms of responding to people in extreme states. I know like, I mean, I'm a social worker in a jail, so I see people when they first come in, and I, I really question, like, um, when people talk about defunding the police, I wonder if they, you know, and that, like, oh, men mental health professionals might be better suited to respond. I wonder, have they ever seen someone in an extreme state, and have they ever personally tried to respond? Because it's scary, and it's and it can be dangerous. And so I just think that um, educationally it would be, and there are very few people, I guess I will say this too, um, having worked with the folks at the, the DART, from the DART team in, the, in Hampshire County, um, there are very few people who are really suited to do this work you know, to actually intervene in crisis who have the nervous system to do this. <laughs> it is a really tricky thing. And I'm not, I'm definitely not saying, you know, the police certainly don't get a lot of things right. I'm not, I just think that it's tricky. It's really tricky. And so educating, I think that would be awesome because I think a, a comprehensive needs assessment has to happen. We have to figure out like, well, what role, you know, like this was already made, this request was already made. Um, what role do we really think social service could fill? And, and then, um, even understanding how many of those kinds of complaints are the are our town's police responding to, and figuring out where are people who are in social service, not in public safety, doing this successfully, and and like who are the people who do that? You know, I just think that there is a lot more studying and educating that needs to happen. And I guess the other thing I will say is that like this originally began as a response to racial inequity and injustice. And all of a sudden it's morphing into thinking that we could get social service to respond to mental health and possibly substance use crises. But that still doesn't solve the original problem, which is when the police move in to communities of color, living areas that, you know, uh, just like that doesn't solve that original problem of how the police are interacting with communities of color. I don't, in my mind, it doesn't. Those are, those are like two different, those are di three different populations. They're not, you know, there, there could be people in extreme states, people involved in substance use, you know, those can be people who are of all races and ethnicities, right? So it doesn't necessarily solve the original issue for which this, um, this, you know, this began, this movement began. Mm -hmm. Sid, did you want to say something? Yeah, you know, I, I totally agree with that, Deborah, especially the last part, you know, with the, how do you solve the original problem, right? Um, because we can't forget that that's how we got started. But on the other on the other side, when we were talking about our role, um, I think I understand our role. But also, I want to put some ownership 
into the town, right? And try to figure out what is the town also doing, you know, from, from you know, the town manager to all of these departments, right? What are they doing um, in, in looking, at, you know, inwards and saying, you know, what kind of, of education are we doing to be anti-racist, right? Um, and then I think once we know that, then we could either supplement it or help with that, right? Because even though it's, it's, it's part of our mission, I don't think it's our sole responsibility. And I know that you're not saying that. You're not saying that. But I think that, that some people may think that it is the responsibility of the Human Rights Commission to deal with all of this stuff, right? Um, and personally, you know, I think it's, it's the town's responsibility. And then we then come in and we supplement, we give ideas, we, you know, we take care of some of the other pieces, like when people file complaints and all that, and we work with all of that. And so I would be really interested in, in, you know, finding out what is the town doing from, from uh, you know, the town manager on the way down and, and all of these departments that we have in town. And no, not just I spoken on police. Right, no, I, I appreciated, um, the quote from uh, Paul Bockelman in uh, the Amherst Bulletin last week, I assume the Gazette as well, but the Amherst Bulletin that said, uh, the town has to recognize that there are uh, uh, inequity issues and uh, the town has to do something and that requires uh, putting some uh, financial support to that. Um, since, I've served on the Human Rights Commission, so that's uh, now for the last five years. I have asked um, every year uh, whether there is room for carving out a, a specific role so that there is an actual job for Director of Human Rights, right? That's what was originally called for in the Human Rights Bylaw uh, in 1998 or 1999, whenever it was originally passed. Um, and we had that for some period of time. Um, I've been told that that was rolled into uh, the human resources role because it needed to be someone who was in town hall, who could receive complaints, uh, who would be able to have connections with everyone who is working in the town so that they could resolve the complaints uh, more easily, more quickly. Um, I've also been asked well, where am I getting it from the budget? Because there's a budget that is set and there's unions and there are people who uh, have expectations of what they're gonna get paid. Uh, and if there isn't someone who is going to be receiving complaints all the time, um, or if, if they're gonna receive two complaints a month or, and it turns out that they're not complaints that people wanna follow through with, why would we hire someone and spend the town's money on that? The difficulty with that analysis is it assumes that the education that we would like to be able to share with other people in town or that the town should be getting um, can just be done internally in every department, that there's not gonna be a conflict for the funding within each department that is always going to say you know, if I have to choose between giving you two more sick days a year, or if I have to choose between something else, uh, and taking that money away and putting it towards someone who's going to be able to coordinate conversations around um, around equity, around racial equity, and other types of, of equity, um, I'd prefer to put the money into someone who's going to pay attention to this day in day out, and who has a responsibility of educating. Um, and, and working with everyone throughout the town. Um, I, I will acknowledge I was a little bit surprised um, that it, two of the town councilors who came to our last meeting had no idea that people were concerned about racial equity in the town of Amherst. I, I found that a bit incredible uh, because I, it, it's something that we talk about year over year over year um, and if there isn't a point person that is making that clear, um, then there's a problem. So I, I, I think that that's, that's, um, that question of what we need to do as a town 
goes to consistency. And I will also say with, um, without attacking us as a group, usually there, you have a three-year cycle to be on one of these committees or commissions. Um, and that means that there should be people stepping down every year and new people coming on every year. And if we tend to lose people in, in somewhat large groups, um, for us, that would mean we'd lose on average three people every year. There are new people coming on who have to learn what we do before we take the next steps to um, support the town. We need someone, um, we need to have consistency in uh, the town office. And I, I really appreciate um, a town manager who understands what our role is. I really under, uh, appreciate uh, Jennifer and before Jennifer, um, Deb, uh, uh, who was able to take on a role of saying, well, here's what the commission can do. Here's what some of your limitations are. Um, cause that was helpful for us. Um, if we don't have that, uh, or if we don't have the town council aware of what our role is, uh, such that again, we are not meeting for three months uh, because we're non-essential and then um, end of May comes along and all of a sudden the town council is concerned that we need to be moving on anti-racism and there's a question of, well, who can we use to help us deal with this issue right now? Let's talk to the Human Rights Commission. Well, that's great, but you told us we didn't need to meet for three months. Um, so that's, that's an issue. So, um, you know, I, for one, would think, again, if the town is putting money towards uh, something, I, I'm not trying to take it away from anything else, but I'm just saying that if we put money behind someone whose role it is to really work in, in uh, developing education for different departments in the town on anti-racism, um, and other ways to support the community without violence, that might be helpful. Um, as it stands, even well-meaning ideas, and I brought this up before uh, to this group, when Chief Livingstone really uh, was thinking about having more police officers um, go through housing complexes more often. Um, and my view was places where there are thinner walls, higher concentrations of people, people in conflict with each other more often, perhaps just because of that. Um, you know, liaison officers, great. Um, but patrol officers going through and over-policing that area, not good. Um, and so having that conversation with him where he was able to say, oh, I hadn't thought of it in that way. That's great, but we need someone consistently who can say, no, we talked about this last year. We talked about this five years ago. We needed to develop a plan. And uh, Chief Livingstone, we're going to support your plan moving forward, but it has to contain anti-racism as a component of it every year. Um, so I think that putting money towards something like that would be would be good to do and would create consistency. Um, and so that's something I, I I don't know exactly how we would propose that either to um, town council or, or again uh, bringing it up with the town manager. But I think it's something that. Um, I've, I've in the past yielded saying, I hear what you're saying, you don't have the money right now. I, I see that though as not being the right answer. Um, and I, I think the money needs to come from somewhere um, for, and I think that the role should exist. You know, um, I, I'm listening to you and I, I, I always, I mean, I mean, we're just, we're one commission, so whatever ideas we come up with may or may not fly or be welcome. Or, But I know like in my work on the opioid task force, um, this was a really like to have, so we had a coordinator of the opioid task force and um, that job started the process of community conversations gathering, um, all the stakeholders in areas where, you know, that were touched by the epidemic. And so now I'm thinking about a social justice coordinator or 
a racial equity coordinator, like call it whatever, you know, name we want to use it and bringing the stakeholders in public safety, bringing the stakeholders in um, the housing units, bringing the stakeholders in public health, bringing the stakeholders in education, in, you know, in all of the arenas where social justice issues matter, you bring people to the table and you meet once a week. And through that dialogue, uh, like the group magically comes up with incredible solutions. And before you know it, you have, you know, new programs grow out of those dialogues and um, new partnerships grow out of those dialogues. And somebody sitting at that table is a great grant writer and new ideas for writing a grant come out of those dialogues. And so I do wonder about this idea of proposing a position, a social justice coordinator, or you know whatever we want to call it, that literally just begins the process of like every every week there is a new um, like each group. So like say it's the public safety and public safety arena. Those people meet once a month at a predictable time. You know. Um, the housing unit people meet once a month at a predictable time. And the coordinator is at all of these meetings. So they're meeting throughout the week, they're meeting throughout the month, but each, each sector is only meeting once a month. I'm not sure if I'm saying that in a clear way. Um, and, and little by little over time, magically, like the community comes up with its own solutions. The people who attend these meetings come up with their own solutions and bring their skills to the table as well. I've seen it done. And I think that could be an incredibly exciting thing to happen in our town. So I know that there are two community groups that are already working on stuff to present to Paul and or to the town manager and the town council about a the eighty thousand dollars that is supposedly going to be allocated if it hasn't already been approved to be allocated for uh, I'm going to say race and equity. I'm not quite sure what exactly the eighty thousand dollars is for. I don't think anybody really knows, but I think part of these community groups are will help decide that. And then I also, it seems that these groups, these groups are in talk and will bring it to the town manager's attention of, I mean, I don't know for sure that that's how it's going to go down, but I think that there are groups that are going to be meeting with the town manager and the town council to try and help figure some of the stuff out and break into other subgroups perhaps with other community members to try and touch all the areas of an inequity that happened for the people with the people of color with people of color Jennifer who's in those groups I I sadly enough get abolished from all side community groups but um I D Shabazz is in is I think is plays a critical role in the groups that are going to be um working there is a race equity task force, I think, that is forming now that's through the community. And then there is the Black Indigenous People of Color group that I think is starting to become an or a larger organization or community organization as we move forward through this. So I think that the, both of those task force there, which, you know, it's kind of hard when you so like you, if the Human Rights Commission or even if there was a human rights director, all of those commissions, so anything that happens through the town has to meet those open meeting laws, which sometimes, and just town government somehow is, can often be very stifling and so it doesn't move as fast as it, as people would like. So sometimes when you have community members that are moving forward the ideas, or um, it helps it move faster, right? Because they can get some of that legwork done that would take the town more time to do. Right, I think one of the difficulties though is uh, an argument that was made against town meeting and for town council was that, um, that people who are in town meeting um, 
could talk with each other and could conspire and could aggregate power to themselves. I, I, I did not buy that argument myself personally. Um, but the idea was supposed to be, we need something where people can see where you're, where you're coming from. Um, and therefore, if we have a limited number of town councilors, um, we can figure out uh, what they're meeting on, when they're meeting, and we can kind of hear from them. It's incredibly frustrating to be in any kind of, of town government uh, entity where no two of us can talk about stuff that relates to our work, for example, the Human Rights Commission, outside of this meeting without violating the open meetings uh, law. And because of that, um, we try to schedule regular meetings. We meet uh, once a month so that there's time between meetings for us to do something and, and try to get, uh, get other things done. Um, and we try to, to meet and talk with, with other people in the town. Um, but at the end of the day, we know that we have to come back and, and report back and be subject to others from the town seeing us, asking us questions and responding to them. Um, that's not at all to say that there um, shouldn't be however many community groups that want to form and communicate amongst themselves, there should be. Um, but as far as eventually the town spending money on something, it's the town is going to need to make a decision based on uh, an analysis of what whatever that, that group is, um, has been thinking through what their reasoning is. And um, I, th I think eventually they're going to need to kind of have an open conversation over a period of time so that they can know that the logic uh, being applied by the group is, is correct before they allocate resources. So I think eventually it's gonna get slowed down in any event. Um, I also think there's a, a question of, 21 years ago, um, the town voted and said, we need to have someone who actually coordinates this stuff. And about, you know, 14 years ago or whatever, um, people feel like the person who is doing it for the town is not focused on everything that they'd like uh, that person to be focused on. And then we roll that into human resources and then we don't really have that director position in place. Um, I mean, I do kind of wonder whether this is a, um, a solution that's already in search of a problem, that the role is one that exists in town bylaws um, that is meant to do exactly this thing. Now, that doesn't mean that um, if we were looking to hire someone, we couldn't use uh, you know, what the race e equity task force is looking for um, or, um, or the other group that you mentioned um, is looking for. I mean, all that information could come in and it definitely doesn't have to come through us, it has to come through the town. But it just seems like there's room already for someone to do the work for the town where they're going to be focusing. And I, I think that when this was created, I wasn't here in 1998, 1999, when this was voted on. Um, I've only been here for 14 years. but to the extent that the town 20 years ago said we'd like to get change in a particular way and we've moved away from that and it's on our books. I, I think that there's, we have room to say, we recognize that in our bylaw, we want to see this come to fruition. And um, it's already been approved by the town of Amherst. Um, maybe that's us adding to the task forces that are already um, in existence and are searching for something to say, this is something the town has already approved. We just have to frame it in the way that's already on the books. I don't, yeah. So I don't, I have to get ready to cut it short. I'm so sorry. That's why I'm inter saying something right now. Um, 
the the two you know i i think that the idea is that the town is feeling pressure from the community like right and so that's that's what's going to make the most change the fastest is what it appears to seem like is that the community is making is putting pressure on the town themselves and i i can't really speak much more on it other than that but um i do want to say that i am sending out to the individuals who were at the webinar, I'm sending them out a survey to find out what it is that exactly that they would like. And then, and as far as it goes for conversation. So the intent of the, the webinar was to be converse, you know, community conversation. The PowerPoint was a little bit lengthy. And so it just kind of threw it off and I didn't see it until it, and anyway, so that's that and we will try and figure out what it is or where how we can make next steps by what the community is telling us off of the survey i will, the survey will also be open on our website to anyone who would like to fill it out i know that those two community groups have surveys out there as well so there's just a lot of surveys circulating around at the moment so we i will move forward with that when i come back um from vacation on tuesday and in the meantime i'm the beach is calling me i gotta go I'm so sorry, guys. Um, I love you. Is there anything yeah, else you need? Yeah. I, I need to know, Um, am I a co-host? If you leave... No, nope, I'm going to make you the full host. Okay. Yep. Make host. There you go. The power... Jennifer, of you've you. you've actually been on vacation and you've participated and in the meeting. Oh, no. Yes, I did. I did. But now I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good rest of your Thanks. vacation. Thanks. Yeah. Bye, guys. Hopefully we'll be able to continue because I think the last time I was made host and Jennifer stepped off. Yeah, we're still here. Good. <laughs> All right. Yep, I remember. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, I I wish you'd say one one more minute because um, looking at this, one of the things we didn't discuss. She just mentioned that she's going to be sending out uh, a survey to. Uh, the people who were on the call on July 11th. You'll remember that at our last meeting, um, we were asked by the town council if we could participate in uh, facilitating a conversation, um, perhaps with the police, perhaps with others. Um, it was asked, well, why can't we do our own conversation? As I mentioned earlier, um, I, I had not yet processed you know, how to communicate to everyone that I had already been asked to facilitate the conversation by town council and I had declined personally um, because I, I feel like um, for, for those of us who really want to engage in conversation, if we're made facilitators, we don't, we don't get a chance to talk. Exactly. And, and so it's, it's wrong to ask, particularly if you're trying to have a conversation on anti-racism to try to have uh, people in town who would like to have their voices heard be facilitators because then they can't actually speak to those issues. So, um, but that meant that we, we delegated, uh, we authorized Jennifer to, um, to pull together the, the conversation that we were going to have between our last meeting and this meeting because we wanted to get started. Um, so, I was unaware until I got on the call that that the speaker was planning on presenting to uh, those who signed on for three hours. Um, a three hour Zoom webinar no. is rough. It is yeah. rough. It was good information, don't get me wrong. And, and, um, and Dr. Holmes, Gloria Holmes was the, uh, the person who was presenting. Uh, she did a very good job. She was very engaging, but I don't think um, I, about two thirds of, of the people um, stayed on for all three hours, but you're not going to be able to hold people that long. And the question is, what format are we really looking for if we want people to be able to engage? I don't think the webinar format uh, really gives people a chance to talk to each other. And 
if we are going to try to have community conversations, I think that that's a large part of what people are looking for. And historically, we've had uh, conversations where people come together uh, at the Jones Library um, in whatever the room is downstairs, the Woodbury room, I think, and then people break out into groups of like six. Like we have conversations. Um, I, I don't think that we should plan a bunch of, of webinars where people don't get to talk to each other. Um, but the question is, if in between meetings, we want to be able to move more quickly and we want to encourage conversations, how do we do that when, um, you know, I'm, I'm not staffed for the town of Amherst. Uh, I, ha I have a day job and uh, I, I try to do my work and do it well at my day job and that requires a lot of time. Um, so in between meetings, I have other things that I'm focusing on and I also do some work for the Human Rights Commission. But if there's someone who can, um, if we want to have conversations that are, are occurring and we delegate, we have to live with the repercussions of, of what that looks like. Um, unless we have clear uh, instructions of what it is we're looking for from the get-go that we think will be most responsive to what the town is looking for. And I think that that's where it's more our responsibility to set the tone for what, um, what the conversations could look like and then afterwards see whether um, our, our liaison with uh, town hall can make that happen uh, or if we need to partner with some other group that is already um, able to arrange a conversation and, and see if we can do something together. So uh, but I think we have to do one of those things and we can't, we can't punt on it and say, yes, we want the conversation to occur but we're out of time at our meeting, so let's just see what happens. Any ideas on, on whether we should set a, a framework, um, set parameters for what the conversation should look like? I, you know, the webinar does give you, at least some of them that I've been in, I'm not super duper, you know, um, educated on all of this stuff, but it, it, it gives you uh, uh, an opportunity to break people into groups and, and go into different rooms and have some conversations. So, you know, depends on how it's done. You can still have some conversation, different groups with, you know, different topics that people want to discuss and then bring people back in. It's not the optimum way, I agree with you, but if we want to go and, and, and do something where you can start the conversation and then hopefully once this thing is over, um, this whole pandemic and we can get face-to-face -face continued, then it's, it's a start, right? Um, I agree with you at the beginning that like I personally would, would not want to be one of the facilitators because as someone who lives in town with the had experience, uh, I want to be able to participate in the conversation, right? Um, even though I do have facilitation um, experience, I've done lots of that, but I would not want to be a member of the Human Rights Commission facilitating that. So there was an opportunity to bring somebody from the outside that would, for me, that would make the most sense. My understanding from Jennifer was that once she used the webinar format, she could not create big breakout rooms. Uh, there is there is there is one out there that you can and I can explore that more because there's somebody at UMass who, you know, we have a big group of, of lead cluster directors that meet and he's able to do that. So let me I'll talk to him and see what what he uses um and then come back with it. Uh, next meeting. Let me take some notations here on that. Petula, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about, how, were you on the July 11th webinar? I was not on the July 11th webinar, so I don't know much about that, but I think I would be personally okay with facilitating a conversation as, because um, I, I think I have some things to say, but I also really like just hearing what other people have to say. And I think I, can, I have some 
experience facilitating uh, conversations, but yeah, I could I could try doing that if if we needed someone to do that. I I actually thought the I thought the July eleventh webinar. Um, I agreed with you, Matthew. It was I thought it was great. Everything she was obviously a very skillful presenter, and she pulled together a lot of really wonderful resources. But it was long. Three hours was like way too long. And um, I mean, especially yeah, just on this I don't know Saturday or Sunday, whatever it was, um, in the middle of the day, it was just too long. And um, and I, I, I sort of got a preview to the fact that it was going to be a webinar because I, in a panic, I had emailed Jennifer to say like, "Am I taking notes for this?" <laughs> for this, and she's like, "No, no one is taking notes." And then she made some mention about the Zoom bombing, and um, so I think like not having conversations versus the possibility that the meeting could have gotten Zoom bombed and somebody could have said something really offensive and jarring it maybe was like a better choice to just keep it a webinar a one-way format um but and and it was and like in my mind i was thinking it was just the start it was just the first one let's think about now a series of these to get the conversation and the learning and the education going and i really like the idea of bringing somebody in from the outside so that everyone who lives here has the opportunity to bring their voice into the conversation. Mm -hmm. But Patua, I love the I, I love that you're you would be willing to facilitate. I think that that um, and I just wonder like if we thought maybe we would do a couple of more just educational that were more in the webinar format and then and then lead into then um, a series of dialogues, but I mean, it's tricky, right? Like we're in COVID times, so bringing people together is completely different than what anything we're used to. And um, facilitating an online conversation is so different from facilitating a, a meet, like a, a conversation where you have, you know, six, 10, 15, 20 people in a room together and you can see people's faces and you can, observe their body language and you know and you know the role of like empathy and the heart comes in because you're actually in the room with people you know i agree um but the question i think that also comes in is uh you mentioned having a webinar but then leading into dialogue i do wonder whether if you do three educational things that are webinars, people realize over time, uh, you know, the Human Rights Commission or someone, they're gonna post it on a website at some point. I can look at it if I'm interested. Um, and then they don't really engage in the conversation. Um, there might be a way to do something where you do an educational component and those who participated are able to engage in a conversation in something else where they sign in, they have to sign in by name, they have to be uh, and, um, allowed to enter by the person who is hosting the conversation. So there are ways to do it. It's a lot more work, um, but you know, maybe in ways that would increase engagement for all of the people who, who want to be part of the conversation. I still think the next question is what conversations we are trying to promote. Um, you know, are we bringing in specialists in a particular area because the town of Amherst is ready and willing and needs to have a conversation around something? Um, and if so, uh, I, I, Jennifer and I had a chance to talk with the speaker afterwards on July 11th. So after the three hours, I, I had another half hour um, chance to stay on. Um, and one of the things she said was she was really grateful to be able to speak for three hours because when she's been hired to teach in other places, they've given her one hour and it's not enough time. Um, but you know, the question is, again, do you break it up into different components? Um, and I'm not saying that we have to decide what the next conversation the town should be having is right now. Um, but 
I do think that uh, if we expect there to be more conversations over the summer, that we need to be part of figuring out what that might look like so that we can give suggestions uh, to others or that we can uh, engage the town uh, through our liaison in helping to bring people in to speak. So are we saying that we would want to see more conversations of a shorter duration and maybe have a mix of uh, an educational component followed up by a, uh, a chance for conversation, even if it has to be on a different platform? Or at least, you know, you sign in for the webinar in one way, you sign in for the conversation in, a, in another way. I'm trying to put together as part of what Sid has said, part of what Deborah has said, um, part of what Petra seems comfortable with, um, trying to get us all on, on the same page. But this doesn't have to be a one-time conversation, right? Could it, no. be, could, it could be a series. So yep. um, I agree. I mean, I do a lot, I do a lot of this stuff in, in my social justice role. One hour is not enough, you know. Obviously, we all know that. Um, so if you, I think if you could build a series, you know, of, of con these conversations, then you know, and then assess it as we go along and hopefully continue with it, then that's that would be, and at the same time, making sure that as we're doing this work, that there's um, action steps, right? And achievable action steps, right? Um, that, that will be put in place at the end of each session, you know? And the action steps could be as simple as, you know, giving people a list of resources to read and then come back for a second, so for a second, um, second, third, and fourth conversation. But then to have, after those, to have some very meaningful action, action steps that could be, that could be taken. That would be, that would be my take on it. Okay. So um, by action steps, would you also mean something like, if you're talking about um, police funding, uh, maybe uh, asking people who are there to put together what they would prioritize that police actually do and what they would say maybe they feel others um, would be able to do just so that the police would have that information sure. or the town would. Um, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean necessarily that it's the right answer, but it does mean that after conversation, a lot of people who are thinking through are coming to this perhaps the same conclusion that they would like to see focus in one area as opposed to another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that would be one one of the, the ways. Other ways is you know I mean since there's going to be members of of uh, the town council there, right? Is you know maybe they'll have a they'll they'll chip in and say you know these are the areas that we're looking for, and then folks who are there says okay, so. How are we going to implement this? How are we going to research this? You know, how are we going to assess this? You know, I think those are action steps that are achievable, um, that can then bring some some good outcomes. You know, for the town, because ultimately it's about outcomes for the town, right? Right. And I think as a, a human rights commission, we can help connect. Um, like the public to government um, in ways that might seem like there's like a wall between um, both. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like if we, so like we can have conversations with the community where we just talk about our experiences um, and or, like our grievances and stuff that we've been talking, like we've been experiencing and feeling throughout um, these past months and all of our lives really. But um, <coughs> Uh, we can use those experiences to then we can like facilitate because knowing our role as like a government and and someone who advises government we have expertise to help take those experiences and make it into change so I agree with Sid when he, he was talking about having action steps at the end of each meeting uh, each like con conversation that we have um, but we can use our role as uh, a connection to the government to like help write proposals and help um, like take our experiences and make it into change that we want to see in the community. And so like 
the people who come to those conversations will help the Human Rights Commission like draft like what we want to say, but the Human Rights Commission can take um, that, um, whatever we propose or gather and bring that to like the town council or bring that to the police department and have those conversations that some people might not be comfortable with having or don't know how to talk um, to other people. So we can be like the bridge that helps take experiences, which I think is what the bylaws are about, like educating. We can have experts come in talking about uh, their knowledge about policing or defunding the police or whatever. And then we can also have um, the experiences and the grievances and it will all be public and it will be known that, but it will also be a community where we can like promote, um, like, like we have each other and so then we can take that and then bring it to the council uh, and get what they need what they need to know bring those experts to them so they can get the education they need and our proposals so they can so our the proposals that we make with the other group can make sense with the council group and sometimes those groups can be together or not it could look different but that was just what i was thinking yeah. i i think that 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 sounds right. Although again, it it um, it doesn't have to it doesn't have to come through us kind of drafting things. Um, one of the things that we have seen in the past is, um, for example, in our uh, sanctuary uh, community bylaw, um, th there were a number of people, um, organizers, and um, people on the Human Rights Commission, like Sid, among them, who were working on that bylaw, um, then brought it to the Human Rights Commission for our discussion and our support. Um, they testified, I testified for the commission um, before then our, our select board. The select board said, well, we certainly support this. And then it went to town meeting. And, and so it was a way for um, people who already have a great idea and and you know have some some ability to put together the language that that we would support um, before a government body and and build up the support over time so um, I think that there's a lot of people who have that expertise such that it doesn't have to be us doing the work for them um, but it does have to be us willing to support their work um, and understanding where they're coming from. And so, uh, but I, I think that Petua, that's kind of what you're saying is that if we have these conversations and there are people who are, are trying to get something through that we could be a facilitator in some way. Is that correct? Yeah, I think yeah. that it does, we don't have to necessarily like write everything or like write it out like because people do have that expertise, but we can like help move it forward, I think is what I'm trying to say. So like facilitate and help like push, like give our support or whatever, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Matthew, that was a perfect example of, 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 you know, something that came together and built some action steps and it was achievable, right? Um, it, it did take, you know, almost a year, but it did happen, right? And, and all of these connections came, came together, including human rights, you going and you doing your, you know, in front of, of uh, was it town council at the time? No, it wasn't town council. Yeah, select board. Select board and all of that. And to see that outcome, that's that's what you know action steps is all about, right? Is is to come up with an idea and then say this is how we're gonna work on it. And just like Matthew said and you said that, but there's so many people that have that expertise, it's about bringing those people in the same room and then bringing all those pieces together. Perfect, perfect example, absolutely. So um, do we want to propose the next conversation that we want to have? And I'll acknowledge it's not that different from the conversations we were having where we were trying to figure out which uh, governmental entity did we want to meet with, introduce the Human Rights Commission, explain to them that we were going to be looking at issues of anti-racism and, uh, and equity issues uh, and, and begin partnering with them. That was our plan for this whole uh, calendar year, and we started off in January with the schools, and um, and have uh, since fallen off uh, because we weren't able to meet. But um, so I guess I am asking: Is there a next conversation that we know we want to have? Um, 
and that we want to uh, see if we can manage uh, to organize through uh, someone working in the town who can kind of follow up, get the funding that we need from the town manager's office, et cetera. Well, I'm really curious about these other two groups um, because they're in the, they're people in the community. So I feel like I would love to hear what their, I mean, this is the first I've, I've even known of their existence. So maybe that's my bad. I don't really know. Um, but I would love to hear what they're working on and what they're proposing or what they're wanting to propose. And um, because that's in the community, that, those are the voices we need to hear. I, I don't disagree. However, I, I'm always concerned uh, with, with capture. And what I mean by that is, um, when you get a relatively small group of people, for a revolution, it works really well. If you get a small group of people who want to see massive change, who gain control for a period of time and, and change things greatly because they have a specific vision that they'd like to see. Um, I will acknowledge that I'm probably more of an evolution than revolution person. Um, and because of that, I, uh, I'm wary of, um, of a small grassroots um, group that says it wants something without there being some kind of process by which what it is they're arguing for gets, gets heard and gets um, argued through um, in a way where there's a chance to kind of challenge it and, and make sure that it's, it's the right idea. That said, I also recognize that if we send things through the democratic process uh, where you have to vote on everything in a town that might have um, a majority view that wouldn't understand what all the problems are, then you won't get a lot done because people will not understand why they're voting, um, why it matters to vote one way or another. So I, we're in this spot where we do need to hear from uh, and amplify voices that have not been heard. Uh, but we also need to make sure that what it is that's being argued for is representative of what the concern really is. So um, if, uh, if there's a, a series of groups that have had conversations that people have known about and people have been able to participate in, I'd love to just use that and say, let's move on from there. If on the other hand, um, there's a group of right-minded people uh, who come together and uh, reach out to a circle beyond uh, their, their, that initial inner circle and have really great ideas, um, I'd like there to be some kind of additional process by which uh, other people get to participate uh, rather than us as a government, uh, governmental entity saying, well, that's who we should meet with because they seem to be representative of something. The, the two approaches are not mutually exclusive. You can do that. You can meet with um, that group of people and hear the concerns, which is what we've done all the time when uh, there are people who are bringing things um, before town meeting and they said we just wanted to go to the Human Rights Commission first, we'd have a conversation and sometimes it was someone that had something that really didn't fit within the Human Rights Commission and we would say that sounds really interesting. It's not something that we're going to vote for or against because it doesn't deal with issues of discrimination as, as far as we can see them. Um, but, you know, I, I, if we're going to suggest a conversation. Um, are we going to leave this meeting suggesting that the conversation be with, find out uh, what the, the two groups Jennifer is mentioning are and what those groups are proposing and what their process is and have that conversation next um, or open something up to a broader um, group of people. And, and I, I will say as well, um, 
some of the people who are involved in, in those conversations are people who have partnered with us um, to create community conversation. So um, that's, that's not to say that they aren't necessarily representative. It's just to say that whatever process we buy into, it should be one that we can stand behind and that we support. Um, so I just want it to be something that we decide we want to go forward with. So um, I recognize that we're, we're at the quorum number of four. Um, and ideally, I would have wanted to, for there to be a numerical majority of the, the we are of the current commissioners. But um, I would have wanted as many of us as possible to be part of the conversation of what we would like the town to do, who we would like to see them engage in conversation and how we would like to suggest that the conversations occur. Um, that's what I would like to, I'd like to have as many ideas from us as possible on that. Um, so if there's a limited number of conversations that we are going to engage in in the next month before we're able to meet again, um, how, how do the four of us see that occurring? Um, do we see there being um, partnering with someone else to expand and make sure that there's a community conversation? So looking at the groups that have been in contact with the town on these issues and saying, can we expand on that so that they're presenting in a way that other people are coming and hearing what they're saying and that we can therefore um, support that? And do we feel comfortable trying to um, kind of sponsor that conversation when we are not necessarily um, aware of all the arguments that they're making? Or do we want to sponsor a separate kind of conversation and invite the larger community to come, including uh, those groups of people uh, that are already speaking to the town council? I think those are two approaches that both would in involve um, the people who are doing work already within their communities uh, and say, we want to hear from you. But one of them is saying, we're happy to let you take the lead because this is grassroots and you're trying to start a conversation and we support that. And the other is us saying, um, we think that the conversation needs to be uh, more process oriented. And we think the town should be responsible for that process but we think the town should um, should invite those people who have already been putting the work in. If if um, I feel comfortable with both to tell you the truth, but if you were to ask me to choose, um, based on what you said that you we would want to see more input from commissioners, I would choose more input in commissioners and just from the get go join the conversations that are going on right, and, and support those conversations. And then as we listen, because this has been recorded so the other commissioners can, you know, take a look at it and see what is being discussed right now, um, and then get their input, and then we can have something more robust, you know, that we as a commission can put together. Um, but I'll be, I'll be very comfortable in joining the other, the other conversations, because I, I, I haven't been in those conversations, but I get a gist of what is going on. And I don't think it's unlike what we would come up with. You see what I'm saying? So, um, but that's that's my take. I'd love to hear from others. Um, sometimes at the end of the day, and I've been going since 7.30 in the morning, I feel like I've kind of have lost my ability to parse through the differences that you just said. So I apologize. I just like my brain is, um, Fried. Um, I, I mean, I understand the basic concept that you're saying that um, these conversations are going, we support those conversations continuing to go on, but we probably need to create something different. Um, is that what, is that what you were saying, Matthew? Uh, that, that was option two, which is the town takes ownership mm -hmm. and says, we are going to um, lead the conversations but we want to hear from the people who are already doing the work, but we're making sure that the conversations are open. And the first option was um, we recognize people are 
already engaged in the conversations, uh, we as commissioners support a grassroots effort um, to make change. And uh, we would like to perhaps engage in that ourselves um, or at least understand where they're coming from so that we can opine on it and, and be supportive of it. Um, but we're, we're gonna let the group that has already taken the lead, um, which isn't restricted by open meeting laws and, and uh, doesn't have to have a quorum and all that kind of stuff, we're gonna let them kind of continue to take the lead because we think that they can move uh, more quickly and, uh, and can make changes on a more revolutionary scale. Uh, which, which is the argument for doing it that way and not by following a process where you have a town commission uh, that is taking control of the conversation. I mean, I kind of think there is a way, there's a third option, which is to, um, to you know, and maybe you said this and I'm just not understanding because I, like I said, I mean, I feel like my brain at this point is not, is like all my cylinders are not firing. Um, so, but um, to sort of come in behind these two task forces here and understand the conversations they're having and then, and then additionally build on those with an eye towards us structure, having structured conversations, you know, not just one or two, but like all throughout the fall and all throughout the fall, the coming year with an eye towards being able to inform, you know, I mean, because the original issue, it, well, one of the original issues, right, is, um, well, all the ways that inequity shows up, but specifically right now, it's very, very hot in the realm of public safety and policing, right? And so one conversation that's on the table is defunding the police or not defunding them, but you know, taking a portion of their budget and attributing that in other directions. And as you were saying, this is sort of, in my mind, this is where we initiated this conversation, which was, this is probably not gonna be happening in this budget cycle. We're looking to next year and to be able to do that, there needs to be more information. We need to study this. We need to have a needs assessment. We need to understand this more carefully before we make a recommendation and before town council can actually craft this into the next budget cycle. And so in my mind, and maybe this is just too ambitious and too idealistic, like I'm hearing nine conversations from September to June, one a month. Like this is not just like a one and done. This is like community conversations on race and all of the places, all of the domains where racial inequity shows up and impacts people's lives in all kinds of ways. And so to me, I guess I'm just wondering, well, what if we started by listening to the conversations that are already happening, even though these are small and vocal groups, but it's, a, it's already happening. So it's a, way for, like, it's a way for us to begin this conversation and as the HRC also gets involved with them, I feel like that, I, I don't know, I just feel like numbers begin to grow. And we start to understand a little bit more about, you know, maybe it's like nine different conversations, one a month that happen all throughout the coming year. So, um, Petro, I, I wanna hear from you as well, but I also want to, um, to get a sense of what we think that that next conversation should be. Should there be um, a conversation that we, whether we participate in or we call for, uh, that is about that, that funding question? Um, or do we feel like that's a conversation that others have just had and we don't need to call for that? We you know, are looking for something else. Um, I think, I think that, uh, in terms of like listening, people who are already thinking about what they want and how they're going to get it, I think we should listen to what they have to say and offer that to the public as well. Cause these are public meetings or gatherings and it can be shared with multiple people, um, in multiple spaces. Um, and we don't have to agree or disagree with anything. We just have to hear or provide the space for both the 
public and us to hear what they have to say. Um, and I think that in terms of how, like, I like I agree with Deb when she said that, like, uh, we should have like one each month be consistent and have it be a series and not just a one and done situation. But I also think that there should be like one part that's about like education and one part that's about conversations. Cause I, and I don't know how that would look like, whether that would be like either two different meetings or in the same type of meeting. Um, and I think both are very important in order to understand what you're talking about, what you're experiencing um, in some way. Uh, so yeah, I don't know exactly what it would look like, but I think it's important to have like it be consistently through the next year and it should be like in different types of topics, not just um, the police, although that's a really pressing and like hot topic right now. Um, that could be like resolved re like with amount, like a certain amount of conversations, but um, I don't, I don't know what we would do uh, with that. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. So let me ask if we're talking about something like a conversation a month, are we going back to the idea that we um, originally had last November of saying um, we need to have uh, a focus on anti-racism and you know education one month? So and, and let's say we then meet with uh, the educators and students who pull together um, in Petua, you spoke at, at this one, um, the uh, the educators for Black Lives Matter, um, do we then have something where there's a learning component to um, to education and Black Lives Matter, like, you know, pedagogy or uh, how do you bring different voices in the classroom, things like that, and then a, a so let's say that's in a one hour introduction to the ideas behind it uh, with some kind of uh, expert who wants to speak on those issues. And then a, another one hour conversation that follows. So a two hour day um, where people break into groups and talk about how they're going to use that in their classrooms, in their, um, in their homes and that kind of thing. Um, but education being like, let's say a September thing when, when people return to school and get really excited about being educated once again. Um, and then October move on to um, housing disparities. Uh, and because that kind of organization, I, I agree with it in theory, it is kind of hard to pull together to make sure that you have um, the process by which um, you're going to have the right people come every month, uh, whether you're going to maintain interest over time. But I, I like the idea of it, if it's something we could pull off um, or something that, that the town will support and, um, and that the town can pull off with some support from us and some uh, ideas coming from us. Is, Petra, is that what you were thinking about? Yeah, I think, I, I think it was either either like having like a two hour session with one hour's in like uh, education, the other hour is just conversations and commitments, or it could be like two different discussions. Like one, the first one's like education. And after that, like we have another one dedicated to conversation. So that way no one feels rushed in either one or like it's, it's like set out, but that would require a lot more yeah. organization um, in general. Um, but yeah, both, I think, both ideas are, I think it's important to have both. That's all I'm really saying. So. so I'm looking at our agenda and we are coming up on, we're, we're on the uh, C and D components of our action discussion items from the timing that I had on the side. Um, so that means fall planning and what our roles can be. Um, so we're right where we should be in the conversation. Um, I'm just wondering if there's something concrete that we want to to recommend um, for for fall, whether we want to try to plan something um, for August and whether it's something that we want to say we'll start up 
in late August. It's a busy time for a lot of people. A lot of uh, things are occurring. Um, and and we, whether we want to get off right when everyone is busy and say, we want you to commit to this, or whether we want to start in September, um, and if so, who do we want to reach out to, and what do we want to see first? Um, and I, I think what I'm hearing is uh, from Deb, there are um, some groups that are working specifically on uh, on uh, race equity, and uh, you know we can kind of communicate with them and try to hear what they're doing and perhaps create a discussion around that. Um, I don't know it, how that fits in with our plan of anti-racism and, um, and doing something every month and making sure that there's both an educational component and a, uh, and a community conversation component. So I love all of the ideas. I'm just trying to figure out how. I think if we could start by seeing what's happening and connecting with it, that would be great. To tell you, should me, August, I'm not going to be able to do anything because UMass is, is going to open. So I wouldn't be able to re-engage again until September. And that's like God on the shoot because August is just going to be a nightmare. Um, so, and, and then we also had talked earlier about us doing an assessment of what the town is also doing, right? Um, and, and, and maybe joining up with some of that if there's something that's doing, because again, it's not just the responsibility of the human rights. So that would be my take. Yeah, and what you're saying, Sid, um, I mean, even those of us who aren't necessarily in education, if we have kids, we're thinking about, are our kids going to go back to school? Is that going to be safe? And what, you know, like, what decision do I need to make as a parent? And mm -hmm. yeah, so there's a lot that everybody's going to be considering in August. I know you're paying. I'm, I'm in the ABC house. I got seven young men that I have to make decisions on and it's <laughs> not going to be easy. Not going to be easy. Oh my God, I have so many questions for you, but I'll stop because <laughs> <laughs> this is not a personal dialogue, but wow. I know, right? You can call yeah. me tomorrow or something. I know, I'm just trying to think about like, how, how, how would you even do that? Make decisions about right. somebody else's children's safety? Yeah, <laughs> not, it's a lot of conversation with the parents, believe me. I mean, which also makes me think about one of the conversations to be about health equity. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. and obviously it doesn't, I mean, maybe that could be the first one, right? Because that's what is on all of our minds right now is how do we stay healthy? And that's harder for some, you know, people, individuals and groups of people than others. Correct. You know? It is. Yeah, and I think, I thought, so I think we should do, we should whatever, if we're having these conversations, it should start in September, definitely, because we all have um, things to think about in August and decisions to make that might take our time away. Um, I thought personally that we should start with like, like what our role as, I think it should be like specifically anti-racism. I don't think we even know exactly what we want to do. So if our first conversation is deciding how we want to engage in anti-racist conversations um, and have the public give their input and have experts talk about their experiences with anti-racism and the work that they do. I think that would be a good first conversation. And then we can move to like health equity. Um, and then also I was thinking about doing um, environmental racism and other stuff like that and schools and stuff like that. And then housing. Like, I think we, we could easily find different discussions for different months, but I feel like starting with anti-racism as like our first conversation and what exactly that means to us and what we want to move forward in whatever discussion we're having, having anti-racism be like the core of what we do. I think that's really important. And we can start that in September um, and bring people in. And right now just engaging in conversations with people that are already doing the work so that we can just ask them when we're ready to like share what they've done over the summer and engage in conversations later after we like establish what we do. Yeah. 
Um, so it's sounding to me uh, like we are going to reach out to the town and say that we understand that there are conversations that are ongoing. Um, please let us know about those uh, conversations to the extent that um, they will touch on issues of equity uh, within the town because that's that's something that we're supposed to be focusing on. We don't have to be the only educators. We live in a town full of people who, no matter what they do, are ready to educate you. Um, so we're 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 good on on getting educators in the town. Um, but that is part of our role. So um, if if we can kind of find out what conversations are occurring, um, I I would say that the um, the July 11th conversation was specifically, I mean, it's, it's three hours on anti-racism. Um, but I think, Petua, you raise a really good point about trying to put us in a position where we situate ourselves in that discussion at the beginning of the year um, and, and allow for conversation around that. Uh, I don't know if we can use the material that we've got because it would be a lot to ask people to kind of just sit and, and watch that, although maybe they'd be willing to do that um, as part of the educational component of the anti-racism discussion before the conversation itself. Um, so do we know whether we're able to um, meet in August? Um, I have to look at, at when we would typically meet. I recognize that in the past, the Human Rights Commission has uh, often taken a break over the summer, uh, and we have not done that thus far this year. Um, let's see, I think we would typically have met on the third Thursday, which would be August 20th. So we're talking deep summer, um, that's the period in which uh, if people are able to take vacations before a school year begins, quite often they're doing it. Um, or for those of us who are already um, in orientation that week for our schools. We're, um, we'll be in orientation that week um, and, and somehow trying to drive our, our kids to college for those who are dropping off their kids to college next August. Um, so do we, uh, do we have uh, the possibility of a meeting? Will at least um, a few of us who are here now know that we can meet August 20th. And again, there's nothing magical about that date. It's just a date that um, the commissioners have said they would uh, try to make themselves free the third Thursday of every month so that we can meet as a group. Um, do we think we can have the meeting in August? That'll help us set up for, for what we're doing in September. I personally could meet earlier in August. That week is the week I'm supposed to be on vacation, so. Right. But I could do one of the earlier weeks if others can. Does would the thirteenth work? That's when we have the uh, the house. I have my housing. Um, I I could do it from six to seven because the the housing um, housing meeting is at seven o'clock. So I could I could do six to seven on the thirteenth. That would be a problem. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I mean, we can we can try to start the conversation, and and whoever can stay on can stay on. Um, we could also try to do it earlier, although depending on how work days look, it doesn't always help to try to shift it to five because sometimes there's just not time in the day. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I know I couldn't do that. Okay. Let's go 13. Let's go 13 at, at six and then, you know. Okay. The, the one last point that I will make, and I'll, I'll see if we can um, reach out to the town and, and if there are conversations that are ongoing, um, let us know about them uh, to the extent that they're, they're uh, not private conversations such that we can uh, follow along and, and try to be supportive um, of a grassroots effort. Um, the second thing that I want to bring up is um, we are looking to fill out the commission. Uh, again, our quorum is four because there's an expectation that 
at any given point, there are going to be people involved in school in something else where they're going to have to miss meetings. Um, but the, the more people we have on the commission with a maximum of nine. So right now we're at six because three people came off. Um, so if we can refill to nine, that puts us in a position where, again, if there's a couple of us who say we can't make it, that's okay. Uh, because there will likely be other people who can show up and be there for the meeting and keep moving things forward. So I'd ask you to consider people you would recommend uh, to apply to be on the commission. Think about it. You don't have to answer right now, but uh, but please do encourage uh, the right people to apply to um, serve on the commission. And they they would apply through the website, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I may have someone actually. Let me talk to her. Great. Um, so uh, when we do meet on August 13th, at that point, uh, give some thought to how you'd want to frame an event in September uh, and what you'd want to prioritize if we we're going to try to do something month after month after month. Because uh, I, I think we can, we can then get things going um, and feel like we're hitting the ground running this upcoming year. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, good. All right. Um, is there anything else that we should uh, discuss right now, or do I hear a, a motion? Yeah, I'm hungry. A motion. I, <laughs> I know. Just... I, have to eat. <laughs> I second right. the motion. All right. I'm assuming that's an, a motion to adjourn. And a motion to adjourn, yes. All right. Um, made and seconded. All in favor. Aye. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you. Have a good Have night. Have a great night and talk to you soon. All Absolutely. right. Good night, yes. everybody. Good night.